As you know, in our chapel program, we seek to bring to campus Christian leaders who are saying important things, people who are speaking prophetically to the church and to the culture. One of the topics that we like to address from time to time is the subject of marriage. And this, of course, is part of the huge ongoing campus conversation on matters of relationships, sexuality, calling, vocation, and spirituality, and other issues as well. These are complex, interrelated things. I became acquainted with uh, this morning's chapel guest, Gary Thomas, more than 10 years ago when he published his book entitled Sacred Marriage. And what intrigued me was the subtitle of his book, really a question, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? An interesting question. Gary Thomas's writing and speaking comes out of a depth and breadth of appreciation for scripture, church history, classic literature, as he addresses issues of our relationship to God in our relationships with one another. An interesting side note, Gary is one of the contributors to the Spiritual Formation Study Bible. In addition to this morning's chapel, Gary Thomas will be presenting a second talk as a follow-up to this morning tonight at 7 o'clock in the Phelps Room in the Beamer Center. A good amount of that time will be given to Q&A. So please welcome to Wheaton College Chapel this morning, Gary Thomas. Thank you. Am I back on now? Before we start talking about making a wise marital choice, I need to know who I'm talking to. And I found that most people can divide up into two categories. There are dog people and there are cat people. You know what I'm talking about? How many dog people do we have here this morning? How many cat people? Okay, you got to be brave to be a cat people. I, I've never had a cat, have had tons of dogs. And so I never could have imagined that part of being a good husband to my wife would eventually be having a funeral for a cat. But that happened when I was going through seminary. At the time, my wife and I just had one child. We had a little toddler. And we lived in a tiny little home that had a shared driveway with another tiny little home that was rented by a single gal with her cat named Remington. Remington sort of claimed the whole property. And one morning, I needed to get to the library. I had a lot of work to get done. But as I started to pull out of the shared driveway, right in front of the driveway, I saw Remington splayed out. He'd been hit overnight by a car or truck or something like that. I thought, I can't really leave him there like that. So I went to our neighbor's door, knocked on it as gently as I could, tried to explain what I'd seen. She came out. She started crying. That drew my wife and daughter's attention. So they came out and, and they started crying. So I'm practically crying now, not because I really care that there's one less cat in the world, but I, I, I want to be a supportive husband. I want to be a supportive father and a good Christian brother to our neighbor. They finally decided that before they could move on, we needed to have a funeral for the cat. And as a young seminarian, wasn't sure about having a funeral for a cat, but I thought, look, if it meets their needs, what can it hurt? So they were sharing a few words, and I have to confess, I had to hold my tongue a little bit when somebody said Remington seemed like an unusually smart cat. He just got hit by a truck. He's a cat. You think he could <laughs> jump out of the way? But we finally got him in the ground. I thought with some degree of sensitivity, I could get back to my studies at the library. And so our neighbor peeled off into her house. My wife and daughter went into ours. And just as I touch the door handle of my car, I hear this scream from our neighbor's house. I run up her stairs, and she's white-faced ashen. She can't even speak. She just points at her couch and there sat Remington waving his tail. We had buried somebody else's cat. <laughs> to this day, I don't know whose cat we buried. I mean, it's amazing. The markings look the same, but my first funeral was a complete farce. Uh, but I never, getting married to my wife, contemplated that that would be an aspect of one way I could show love to her, and that's Sort of the point I want to make at the start of this morning, you have no clue what you will face later on in your life. Should you choose to get married? 
The stories I've heard as a pastor, catastrophic medical diagnoses, the pain of seeing children die before you do, uh, addictions, unemployment. You, you have no clue what you will face in this life. You can't possibly know. But here's the thing, and this is so key, God lets you choose who you face those things with. You don't know what you'll face, but God says, I'm going to let you choose who you go through those things with. One, you get to choose whether you do it as a married person or as a single person. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul urges us to consider singleness. He says that's a very legitimate and often a reasonable choice in life. But if we decide to get married, he makes it pretty clear in 1 Corinthians 7, 39, when he says this, talking to, to women, she is free to marry anyone she wishes only in the Lord. So Paul seems to make it clear, your choice of whether you want to get married or not, it's your call. Who you want to marry, it's up to you. Introvert, extrovert, business guy, uh, athletic woman, it, it's your call. Just make sure they're in the Lord. And I cannot stress to you how important, should you choose to get married, how crucial that decision is. Every day of your life will be influenced by that one decision. I call a wise marital choice uh, the gift that keeps on giving. If you make this choice wisely, you will be blessed literally every day of your life by having made that choice. Just as I was walking as we were praying, somebody was complimenting my wife about how wonderful she is. And she's right. Because I made that one choice 28 years ago, I am blessed every day because I get to be with her. But a foolish, a poor marital choice is like a bad investment that keeps sucking you financially dry. You'll feel like you can never fully get away from it. This is the one decision you want to go into with your eyes wide open, with objective truth, with counsel, with all intent and purpose because it is so huge. I remember talking to a man one time. He was a pastor. Guy's guy. He's not particularly emotional at all but as he was describing his marriage as this is the word he used the, the phrase he used the biggest cross in his life he spontaneously started to cry he's describing it as this anchor holding him down a parachute holding him back and he was committed to his marriage he believed in marriage he wanted to honor God in his marriage but it was a burden for him every day in fact he said the biggest burden in his life and those spontaneous tears told me just how deeply he felt that pain. And then at a conference, I was talking to a woman who had had just unbelievable medical challenges in her life. It makes you cry to think one person has to go through that in one life. But then she began to describe how her husband had been there by her side, how he had been her rock, how in the midst of some of those treatments when she felt like the ugliest person on the planet, he made her believe that she was never more beautiful and she too broke out into spontaneous tears. But these were tears of joy. I don't know how I would have faced this without him. Next to becoming a Christian, marrying him was the best decision I ever made. Now, I, I don't... I, I'm sorry that that kind of falls into gender stereotypes when I'm talking about a male leader and a woman needing help. Those are real stories. I'm not making an implication. Put that aside. Here's what I want you to get out of this. One person looking at their marriage crying tears of pain and frustration. One person crying tears of joy and thankfulness. Statistics would tell me 10 years from now, 90% of you will be married. If you're talking to me about your marriage then, will you be crying tears of joy or tears of frustration? Will you be filled with tears of thankfulness or tears of regret? Now the reality is, and any married person here will tell you this, every marriage has plenty of both kinds of tears. It's not like any marriage is all sweetness and light, and usually it's not like every marriage is nothing but bad. But it is true that some marriages seem to be life-giving. They, they help lift two individuals to come, become more than they would have been as individuals. And other marriages, for whatever reason, seem to be contests of discouragement and criticism, and they drag each other down. I want you to be crying tears of joy ten years from now. Which is why I want to pray that God will take these words and help plant them in your soul. If you'll pray for me. Lord, with me. Father, I do ask. This is such a momentous choice. Lord, and you care so much. 
You can see the families that will be created from the people in this room. And so I just pray for your gifting of your spirit that I could speak in a way that would uh, contain your truth out of your love. Lord, that you would also open our hearts and minds to receive this. uh, Lord, what I believe is absolutely crucial challenge. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin by asking you a simple question. Do you trust Jesus. It's not rhetorical. I'm actually hoping for a response there. Do you trust Jesus this morning? Do you think he knows what he's talking about? Do you think he has your best interests at heart? I I agree with you. And so when we look in the heart of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us an agenda, I think, for everyone's life. And we don't usually apply this to marriage, but what I want you to do is think about this in the marriage context. It's Matthew 6, 33, and here's what Jesus says. Seek first, first, above all else, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he makes a promise, if you'll do that, these other things that people pursue in that time, it was really food and clothing because they didn't know. We, today, we take those for granted. We're more consumed by romance and other issues of life. But Jesus said, look, don't let the concerns of the world steal you away from this ironclad focus, seeking first my kingdom and righteousness. And the reason I want you to ask yourself if you trust Jesus is this. I hear a lot of Christian singles And I don't know where they found this translation because I've checked out every Bible I could find. I've looked at New Living, New Revised Standard, the NASB, NIV, 1988, 2011 editions. I mean, every one I can get of. I can't find this rogue translation. But it goes something like this. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, except when you're choosing someone to marry. Then seek first sexual chemistry, romantic attraction, relational compatibility. Marry them And then all these things will be added unto you as well. Now, if that was an important exception, I think Jesus would have added it. I think he knows what he's talking about. And if that verse is not true for who we choose to marry, if it doesn't drive one of the most important decisions of our life, what could it be true for? But often I'm finding that Christian singles are getting married for roughly the same reason as non-Christian singles. And I've mentioned those three. Sexual chemistry... Romantic attraction, relational compatibility, you get along, you have a good time on dates. And if those three things are present, we think, well, this is going to be a good marital match. We don't really think through how does our faith, how does our relationship with God challenge that. It is so ingrained in our culture, we never even think to question it. It's like this. When my family and I moved to Houston about two and a half years ago, my kids are older now, they're all in their 20s. Uh, They heard my wife and I talking about having to get a new phone number. And of course they said, why? We said, what do you mean? They said, you've both got cell phones. We have two numbers we can reach you. Why would you pay 20 bucks a month to get a landline? And we thought, hmm, they're they're right. It's just in my generation, that's what you did. When you went to college, you got your first telephone number. It's pretty cool. Every time you moved to an apartment, you moved to a thing, that's what you did. You, you hooked up the power, you hooked up the phones, that's what you did. And so we were just going to do it by habit. And they said, you know, it's really kind of outdated. You don't need that anymore. And if I were to ask you, how many of your parents, both of whom have land, uh, cell phones, are paying 20 to $30 a month for a landline just because they always have? You know, they, they just don't question it. And the same thing is sort of true in our culture that just because that's what we think makes a great relationship, sexual chemistry, romantic attraction, getting along on date type activities, we don't even think that there might be another question to ask. Even people who have been burned by this. I talked to a woman one time. Tough life, two ugly divorces. The guys had been unfaithful. Both had gotten a little rough. So she's talking to me about another guy that he he seems reluctant to marry her. And she really wants my help. And she's describing him. And I become alarmed because he's exhibiting every symptom of those first two guys she married. And so I had to ask her, why do you want this relationship? And I pointed out what I saw. I said, it seems to me you're about to marry the same guy. And she said, Gary, you don't understand. I am deeply head over heels in love with this man. I had to take in a deep breath, all right? I I didn't want to lose. I said, God, let me be gentle. 
I said, all right, let's talk about this. Were you in love with your first husband? Absolutely. I was devastated when he left me, right? Were you in love with your second husband? Yeah, it was different. He met different needs, but yeah, it was terrible when he cheated on me as well. I said, maybe being in love with someone isn't a good enough reason to get married. And I know that sounds so bizarre and that sounds so like we're selling out and that's what our culture would say, but I tried to point out to her, look, following that being in love has led you to two men who not, are not healthy, who are not helpful for you, and you're about to make the same mistake because she couldn't question that premise that if I'm in love, of course we should pursue marriage. And I'm trying to say, not only does I think, do I think scripture would challenge that, I think science would tell us how foolish that is. Let's take that romantic attraction. Because we know so much more about how our brains operate now, I mean, neurologists have made huge leaps and bounds in the last 15 to 20 years. We know the lifespan of an infatuation is about 12 to 18 months. That's what you get. Fun 12 to 18 months, delicious 12 to 18 months, but that's about it. In fact, under a scope, an infatuation at 14 months is demonstrably different than an infatuation at 6. And so making a lifelong decision on a neurochemical reaction that, that really lasts shorter of a time than it takes to potty train one of your kids really might not be the wisest thing to do. And the challenge is to make a decision on the basis of that infatuation. What neurologists warn is that you go into a state they call idealization. You literally start relating to a person who doesn't exist. You create them in your own mind. You ascribe strengths to them through common things that nobody else would do. It's like this. Let's say you're, you're walking through Saga. Guy has his napkin on straight. The, the napkin falls to the ground and he picks it up. And you go to your friends and say, he picked up the napkin. <laughs> Did you see that? He cares about the environment. And I bet he's going to reuse it too. I mean, I just... I've never seen such a conscientious, Christ-like man in my life. Have you? And, you're, what? And, and then you start to see problems with that, and, and you try to point it out to her. You know, are, are you sure? He, he seems kind of angry to me. No, no, he's passionate. That's what I love about him. He's so passionate. I, it seemed to me like he was cussing that person out. No, actually, I think he was speaking in tongues. I think... <laughs> I, I think he's calling on God to, to transform this situation. And, and if you do that, here, it's not your fault. I mean, you're, it's, 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 it's what our brain does. But if you get married in that state, here's what every pastor and every counselor has heard. Five years into the relationship, he's not who I thought he was. And that's a true statement. Because you married on something that can't last. And, and the same thing is with sexual chemistry. Uh, there was a Hollywood actress who was in a popular cable TV series, no longer on the air, during the height of her popularity, wrote a sex manual for couples. In it, she described her husband as an artist in bed. She said he had this virtuoso move that would send her over the top. Within months of the book coming out, it was announced they were separated. Within a year, they were divorced. Apparently, being really good in bed doesn't necessarily mean you're really good in marriage. They're two different things. Now, I'm not saying infatuation is evil. God created it. We can even celebrate it. It's God's design that he made our brains that way. And I'm not saying sexual chemistry doesn't matter at all. In fact, I'll be stronger than that. If there is no sexual attraction, it would be foolish to marry them. It, it, if the thought of seeing this person naked makes you want to vomit, <laughs> please don't marry them, all right? That's, they're going to be real issues later on in, in your marriage. But, but those are things that can't sustain a relationship. Not a single marriage has been sustained by infatuation. And so marrying someone because of an infatuation, or this is more radical not considering someone because there is no infatuation, I think is a foolish thing to do. I had a father come up to me one time. He said, Gary, you got to pray for my daughter. She's been with the perfect guy for four years. Now, as a father of 220-somethings, I'm shocked that a guy would say his daughter's met the perfect man. We're usually more 
far more difficult to please than that. So the problem is she's never had that over-the-top romantic feeling toward him. And she admits he's perfect in every area, but she feels like she's selling out because she's just never been that crazy in love type of thing. And he said, I'm afraid she's going to meet some loser that she'll have those feelings for, half the man that this guy is, and she'll marry him, and she'll have a great 12 to 18 months as a girlfriend and be frustrated for decades as a wife. Do you realize we're not all capable of having the same degree of infatuation? Your ability to become infatuated depends on your neurological map, has sense partly to do with your sense of security and self-esteem. So when I'm a pastor, I have a couple come and they think the other one is more into, they're more into that partner than the partner's into them. I have to explain, we're not all capable neurologically of having the same degree of infatuation. And so I've had women push me back on this, saying, well, Gary, don't you really want your daughters to be in love when you're walking them up the aisle? Now, that's a long answer. I can't answer it this morning. We don't have enough time. I'm going to answer it tonight. So I hope you come to Phelps Hall. There's a long answer I want to get into that. What I'm trying to say is that infatuation alone, sexual chemistry alone, won't sustain a marriage. If you think, though, that marriage is just about sharing an infatuation, having a high degree of sexual chemistry, being able to enjoy each other on a date, the problem is if those three things are present and you don't critique the message of our culture and what you've just assumed those premises, then you're going to say, oh, this is a good person to marry. This is a wise person to marry. And that's why the subtitle of the Sacred Search is this. What if it's not about who you marry, but why? If you don't know the why of marriage, you can't possibly know if someone makes sense to be the who. Let me try to give you another analogy to explain what I mean by that. If I have a different job, I'm going to call a different friend. If I need to repair my roof, there are some friends I would call and some I wouldn't. Because some of my friends would come over, throw a piece of duct tape over it and say, hey, let's go watch the game. And, and, And they're not qualified. If I got sued, I have two friends who are brilliant lawyers. They'd be the first ones I would call. The type of job determines who I want to go through that job with. And the same thing is true of marriage. If you don't know the why of marriage, if you haven't applied your faith to marriage, if you don't know what skills are necessary to have a successful, fulfilling, spiritually profitable marriage, you won't know whether to evaluate someone. You'll just, by default, Am I infatuated? Would I like to see him naked? Do we like to have a good time around pizza? Then, okay, we'll get married. What I'm saying, you could have those three things with any number of people, but it might not be a successful marriage. We need to go deeper than that. We need to ask the why. Because those three things that I just mentioned, in a lot of ways, they're inherently selfish reasons. And you know why so many marriages break down? This doesn't sound so profound, but I'll tell you, it's true. We get bored with each other. Think about it. I mean, this is just a human condition. None of us are so fascinating that we can keep somebody enchanted for five or six decades. We're just not. I mean, even if you're Jerry Seinfeld or Tina Fey, after a few years, your spouse has heard your stuff. They know your stories as well as you do. And selfishness gets boring. Even famous selfish people or rich selfish people or beautiful selfish people why don't hollywood marriages last but if we take jesus's words seriously to seek first the kingdom of god and you've got two people who are pursuing god's kingdom and god is a god who cares so much he 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 throws his passion at us whether it's to stop sexual trafficking whether it's to stand up for the unborn whether it's to get clean water into a country whether it's to take the gospel to places that have never heard it before god cares so much and when he gives a couple that vision and that purpose and if it's ever accomplished he's got plenty more in his back pocket to give to us that enough will that that alone will keep the couple talking and committed and loving and praying together And then when he says, seek first his righteousness, that's actually a great recipe for marriage because if I'm honestly seeking Christ's righteousness, every day I'm dying bit by bit to those things that destroy marriage. Selfishness, arrogance, irritability, harshness. And every day I'm building bit by bit those aspects of Christ. Patience, humility, kindness, gentleness. And I'm falling in love with my wife because she's literally becoming a new person. 
She's not stagnant in her selfishness. She's seeking first the kingdom of God. God is giving her new visions. She's seeking first his righteousness. There's a new woman I have to get to know. She is twice the woman she was when I married her 28 years ago. How could we possibly get bored with each other? Here's what I'm trying to say. Small lives can't sustain big marriages. Small lives can't sustain big marriages. If you get married for selfish reasons to have a small life, I don't care how beautiful, famous, or wealthy they are, it won't last. If you get married with someone with whom together you can seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what you love about that person will be deeper three, four decades into the marriage. It won't fade like infatuation. That's why when... (laughs) Stephen mentioned sacred marriage with the subtitle. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? If I'm seeking first God's righteousness, when I face those issues in marriage that bring up frustration, rather than resent them, I'm thankful. You want, you want to talk about small lives. One of the first big disagreements my wife and I had in our marriage, this is so pathetic, but it's true, was ice cube trays. The family I grew up in, if you got an ice cube, you're supposed to refill the tray and put it back in the freezer So the next person will have a nice full tray of ice cubes. And I'm convinced that's the biblical way to handle yourself in the kitchen. (laughs) My wife, unfortunately, grew up in a family would run those things down to a nice chip. As long as there's anything you could scrape off with a knife, you weren't morally obligated to refill the tray and put it back in the freezer. So as a new husband, not only did I have to get used to drinking warm Pepsi, I had to deal with my frustration that I couldn't explain to my new bride how crucial it was to have this full tray of ice cubes whenever I wanted it. I just couldn't get across to her how important it was. So one night she's speaking romantically to me and I thought, here's my chance, right? I, I, I'm going to use this opening. <laughs> she says, Gary, I'm going to love you forever. I said, honey, I don't need you to love me forever. I need you to love me for seven seconds. She said, what are you talking about? I timed how long it takes to fill the ice cube trays. In the... <laughs> I know, it, it, it's It's pathetic. But when I realized that, I'm I'm not putting holiness and happiness against each other, but when I realized that marriage helps reveal my selfishness, my sense of entitlement, my pride, then I can appreciate those aspects of marriage instead of resent them. It's not like I enjoy asking for forgiveness or granting forgiveness, but to become more like Christ, I, I, I need to do those things. And so I want to marry a partner who will help me do that. And yet that's what amazes me when some Christians even contemplate marrying a non-believer. Can I be honest? 1 John 4, 19, why does John say, why does the Apostle John say we love? He says we love, why? Because he first loved us. So what John is saying that somebody who doesn't experience God's love, who hasn't received God's grace, is not really going to have the knowledge or the capability to reveal that love or to have God's grace. So you're marrying someone with whom you're saying, I think he's so kind, I think she's so wonderful, out of the goodness of their fallen nature, they can love me enough. And what you're really saying there, you know what, the Holy Spirit just isn't that big of a deal. I don't think he makes that big of a difference in somebody's life. I think it's capable to love someone as much on your own as you would with the Holy Spirit working through you. And you know what? Revelation scripture, I don't think it matters that much. I think if someone is generally smart, if they're well read, they don't need special revelation. They don't need to have a passion to study scriptures. I I don't think it matters that much. And, And I think this whole business about wanting to pray to God and... Yeah, it's a little overrated. Things don't really change when we pray anyway. When you contemplate that you would join your life of trying to seek first God's kingdom and righteousness with someone who doesn't even think that way, that's literally what you're saying. Look, marriage is rich, but it's difficult. If I had a hundred lives, I want to be married in every one. But here's the thing. Seeking first God's kingdom has given me a new love for my wife. So that I'm not just saying this as some speaker trying to make a point. That that my wife and I are more into our marriage 28 years in than we were at 28 weeks or 28 months. Because you know what? What really changed my marriage is when I realized I married God's daughter. And when I had daughters of my own, I got it. Because if you want to get on my good side, all you have to do is be good to one of my daughters. 
I know my daughters aren't perfect. I, I know one of them can have an attitude. I know one of them has a tendency to do this. But I'm still praying that God will send them men who will still love them and adore them and, and make them feel safe, even though they have these weaknesses, because they'll always be my girls. And it scares me how desperately I want them to be loved. And when I realize that God feels about my wife, just like I feel about my daughters, everything about my marriage changed. That God isn't just my father. When I get married, he became my father-in-law. And he's passionate about her, which helped me to understand Peter. I never got this before. When Peter told husbands, husbands, treat your wives with respect. Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. I said, wow, that's, that's kind of wild. I thought I had to pray to have a better marriage. And Peter's telling me, no, you have to have a better marriage to pray. When I understood God as my heavenly father-in-law, I got it. Because if there was a guy who came up to me and said, Gary, I'm going to give you 10% of my income. I'm going to memorize your books. I'm going to tell others about you. I'm going to try to get everybody to buy your books. But he's abusing my daughter. He's neglecting my daughter. I'm going to have one conversation with him and one thing only. Hey, buddy, if you respect me, you take care of my little girl. I have nothing else to say to you. We have nothing else to talk about. This is square one. If we're going to keep talking, you show respect to my girl. And when I got married, that's how God looks at me. And guys, this isn't just true in marriage. If you are predatory toward God's daughters that you're not even married to, God has one thing to say to you when you go to prayer. If you want to be intimate with your heavenly father, you better start thinking about him as a potential father-in-law. But here's the thing. Worship becomes more important as you get older. I, I got married at 22, and there have been 28 years now of me messing up and God forgiving me and God restoring me and God healing me and God working with me. His mercies are new every morning. I have 28 years more reason to honor his daughter out of reverence for him. So while infatuation fades, my love and respect and commitment to her grows because it's based on the kingdom of God, not some neurological funny stuff going on in my head and when marriage works it's such a beautiful thing so friends of ours Boone and Annie he's a high school math teacher never had much money they actually make just about as much breeding dogs which is better than breeding cats all right they're bringing good dogs into the world Three beautiful children, adopted five more, two of them from inner city Tacoma. The mom was whacked out, and I see those kids today, and I know what their life would have been, and the miracle of a couple that took them in, and the gift they gave two human beings by being adoptive parents. I've met a woman that does what I do, that speaking up front, and her husband is amazing behind the scenes. He carries her books. He manages the money. He does everything. She is able to minister as she does because he is behind her. Two people in our church, Dave and Tanya, conception didn't come easily to them. They're only able to have one child, but they teach in our church. They're leaders in our church. Such a strong couple. In some, some sense, they become parents in our church. I know very well two professional golfers, one of whom has won a major. They've all won, they both won multiple tournaments. And they say the reason they give testimony to Christ, the reason they still have the money they earned is early on in their life they found strong Christian women who brought them deeper into the faith. They had families. They were responsible with their money. They talk about these young single guys that get all of this money and it is gone in years because they don't step up to responsibility. A good marriage is a gift that keeps on giving. You get one chance. Most of us will get one chance. Trust Jesus in this. Forget what the world values. Seek first what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. We're going to talk tonight a little bit more than if it's not sexual chemistry, romantic attraction, relational compatibility, then what does matter? That's what I'll go through tonight. But I want you to keep Matthew 6.33 in mind. Let me pray for you. Father, I, I just ask your blessing over here. I pray that you would blow up relationships that are not wise, that would be destructive. Out of love, that you would show minds and hearts that these shouldn't go forward. Father, I pray that you might open up eyes of some who would be blinded to each other, where it could be a great relationship, but they've been fooled by this world into thinking it's not what they think it should be. But Lord, for all of us, help us to trust you. 
Whether we're called to singleness or marriage, help us to earnestly seek your kingdom and trust that those other concerns that drive the world, Lord, you'll take care of those if we focus on your kingdom and your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.